just want to no. make sure that we weren't like missing something. No, I'm planning on doing that over the break. I'll I'll complete on the human condition uh, in an online lecture so that when we come back on Tuesday the 19th, we can start on social justice. That's the plan. As with all my plans, that plan may get thrown completely out the window uh, for the next four weeks. Who knows? How is your son? <laughs> uh, better. I mean, his, his elbow was pretty messed up from the rugby game. He tore a ligament in three places uh, and tore a tendon. So, Where did he have surgery? TOA here in town. Up here in Tennessee town. Orthopedic oh. Alliance. Yeah. Same guy who did both my knees. Um, okay, on the origin of humanity, discourse one. Notice, um, I'm trying to think how to put this. What's the main idea, let, let me say, what's the main idea that Basil was trying to get across? I mean, if you, if you could distill it into a single sentence and I'm not I'm not I don't necessarily know that you can I think yeah I think you can um, what is that if you need more than one I'll allow to men being created in the image of God okay That's not a okay what does that mean? And what, the, and what I was just going to say, and what that means as far as um, what would fit humans in the hierarchy of animals and things like that. Right. So what does that say about humanity? Um, set apart from nature, in, in a way. Okay, set apart from nature in a way. It's still part of nature, obviously. But in optimal position. Optimal position. In the same way that a, a king is still sort of part of a country, is sure, still a member of a country, but is you know head of the country. Exactly, exactly. Um, I, I like I like what he says earlier. On. He's, he's talking about how you know if we judged man's dominion over animals by their physical prowess, we clearly would be. Maybe somewhere in the middle if we're lucky, you know. <laughs> you know but, so obviously, you know, our our dominion has to come from somewhere else. Thus, the as, as Tanger was talking about, you know, before the class began, if it's a battle between an individual and a lion, <coughs> lion's going to win. You know, unless we have weapons, the lion's going to win. But if we have weapons, what does that say about us? We have the intelligence to know we need weapons. And we have an intellect that is greater than intellect that he'll go on and say that allows us to overrule them so that we can create, he didn't know this terminology, but so that we can create things that allow us to capture animals that are, that are many times larger than us, animals that live down in the depths of the ocean that normally would not be around us and such. Essentially in, in section two, on page 32, towards the end of that long paragraph, he says, do not despise the wonder that is in you. Okay. That's, that in, in, I think in a sense, you could say that that's what he's really trying to get across. See the glory that is in you. See the wonder that is in you and how you are different than everything else, okay? Could there be an element to this where he is, is, is he addressing a particular thought in the culture at the time? Because there were, because at least from what I understand, there were movements to where, you know, I should say, or at least there have been recently, to like over-emotionalize things without, yeah. without while trying to diminish the, uh, the importance of reason. Yeah, but he's also, I mean, he's also just talking about, you know, in, in terms of the, the creation account, he's distinguishing between 
what Christianity teaches and you know what Stoicism believed, what Epicureanism believed, what many of the competing philosophies believed. You know, I'm trying to remember um, the name of one that is that is almost exactly the same as modern secular evolution. That essentially everything existed. It existed in a rude form or a crude form that eventually got better and better and better and more improved. Uh, That's great chaos. From and I can't, yeah, I know, but there's another, um, it was a particular philosophy, and I can't remember what it is. It's not Heraclitus. But I think he's writing in, in distinction to that. And notice the, the way it begins. You know, I've come to make full payment of an old debt whose repayment I have postponed. It sounds like he's been asked a question. So this is a response, okay, to something that has been raised of him, okay? Go on to this, the third section, where he quotes, Let us make them human being according to our image and likeness, okay? Skip down several lines. I actually go to the top of page 33. And he says, he did not say, as with the others, that is, as with the creation and everything, let there be a human being. Fiat lux, let there be light. Let there be dry land, let there be water, let the water be separated from the water above, from the water. Let there be animals, let there. No, what did he say? He said, okay, let us make. There was counsel in God to consider how to bring the dignified living creature into life. Okay? Counsel. Let us make. That. There's a decision there. There is thought going into. Okay? We've made all these other things. Now, allow us, let us consider how to do these other things. The wise one deliberates, he says. The craftsman ponders. So did he lose his skill and did he deliberate in anxiety as he created in his masterpiece completion and perfection and, and exactitude? Or, okay, so he's, he's talking about the rhetoric involved. Or did he intend to show you that you are perfect before God? Right, so in other words, he's, he's making sure that he's not saying that God had to sort of figure out. How exactly, to exactly. Obviously God would in the very least know the conclusion you would eventually come to. Sure. <laughs> but, but what he is saying is, God didn't just say, let there be man. Let us make means there's deliberation among the three persons of the Trinity. And it's the let us, as St. Basil says, is saying God's consideration that came into the making of man. Because that's not followed with, and there was man. No, because what happened? Uh, let me skip a few passages and go on to something. Um, the human being, let us make man, I'm trying to find the particular passage. Let them rule, let them rule. Um... I may actually be thinking of the second one. It's somewhere in there where he talks about, and God took the dust of the ground and molded. Okay? We'll talk about that when we get to it. So, he says, in on page 33 still, now in section 4, uh, into the long paragraph about just almost half of the way in. Okay? So that you can, actually let me begin at the beginning. So that you may know the sovereignty, that in acknowledging the Father you may not reject the Son, that you may learn that the Father created through the Son, and the Son created by the Father's will, and that you may glorify the Father in the Son, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I should point out, even though we're not reading it, one of the things St. Basil was most known for was he wrote a book on the Holy Spirit. He was one of the first of the Fathers to argue the Holy Spirit is fully God, the same way God the Father and God the Son are, okay? Because people were saying, no, the Holy Spirit's a lesser being, a demiurge kind of a thing. 
Okay, so notice just in this little section right here, I mean, you have the whole Trinitarian formula. Thus, you have been made a common work. It doesn't mean common low. He means you are a work in common of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Meaning, humanity, individual human beings, are also Trinitarian in structure. Okay? There are three parts, heart, mind, soul, okay, to them. You, no, that's a little bit different because that's material and we're talking about immaterial. Thus you've been made a common work that you may be a worshiper of both together, not dividing the worship but uniting the Godhead. That is, worship of the Godhead in an individual human being is united because the person is united. And because the person is united as the handiwork, the creation of the undivided trinity. Okay? Which is why he goes down in the next paragraph. It says, God made the human being that you may unite the Godhead and unite not the hypostases, that are, those are the persons of the trinity, okay, but the power. That is, that passage, God made the human being, is talking about the outpouring power of God. It's that divine power that made the human being. That you may have one glory not divided in the worship, not divided into polytheism. It does not say the gods made the human being. Okay? Which is one of the criticisms that was labeled against Christianity, that it was polytheistic. That it had three gods. Which is why they came up with the definition of God as being three hypostases in one divinity. Okay? Three persons, one nature. The hypostasis of the Father is proper to him. That is, the person of the Father is proper to him. Now, what we would mean by hypostasis is like the, the way we know the Father is proper to him. And that of the Son is proper to him. That is, the Son always confers and always has sonship. The Father always has fatherhood. Blessings, goodness, all these things, being, flows from the Father. Okay? The Son always has sonship. That is, he always owes to the Father. He's always done. Okay? Not my will, but yours be done. And that of the Holy Spirit is proper to him. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit flows from the Father as directed by the Son, essentially. Okay? So why are there not three gods? Because the Godhead is one. The answer is that. Because this is what we believe. In other words, he doesn't offer a rational, logical proof. This is a point of belief. Okay? So he says... For the Godhead which I see in the Father, the same is also in the Son. That is, and by Godhead he means the Godness that is in the Father is also the same that's in the Son, and it's the same that's in the Holy Spirit, and the same which is also in the Son. And emphasizing, okay, the sameness of divinity. So, let us make the human being according to the image and likeness. The us, the plurality, is taken by the early church all the way up through Calvin and, and others as that's a, that's a trinity statement, a trinitarian statement. Let us. In um, Deuteronomy, where Moses writes, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. I think it is Deuteronomy 6, 1, I believe. The Lord our God is one, okay? Jews take that to mean one God, monotheistic, setting him off as distinct from all the other gods around in the land of Canaan, okay? Trinitarian Christians take that to mean, that means the Trinity is one, okay? Unity in diversity. Philosophical issue. So, let us make the human being according to our image and likeness. So we've been created according to the image of God. In what sense? 
And notice what he immediately does away with. It doesn't mean that God has two ears, two eyes, one nose, one yeah. mouth, two arms, two legs. Because what does that say to the poor children who are born without an arm? That they're no longer made in the image of God and therefore they can be discarded? Yes, that's what it meant, kind of, to an early Greek audience. Okay, Which is why children could be, because they weren't perfect. In Platonic belief, Plato's system, the outward manifestation of an individual bears resemblance to what is going on inside. So if a child is ugly, it means they also have an ugly inner, a bad soul. So a deformed body is emblematic of a deformed character. Okay? So, in what sense are we according to the image of God? So he goes on and talks about hands and feet and stuff. God is without structure and simple. Without structure. Why? Because structure implies materiality. Okay. It's one reason. Why else? Limitation. It's limited. Limitation. Structure, I mean... It says it can't be that. Exactly. If it's, if it's bound, then it's not boundless. Okay? So do not enclose God in body, nor circumscribe him according to your own mind. This is that, that idea that God is beyond everything and anything that we He is incomprehensible in greatness. That's that apophatic approach that I've talked about. No, don't conceive a shape. God is understood from his power, from the simplicity of his nature, not greatness in size. Because if, if God were understood by greatness of size, and we talk about God is everywhere present, he's in all things, fills all things. Then his size would be that of the size of the universe and no more. And larger, because the universe is a made thing. God is unmade. <laughs> right, but the concept of size. Yeah, it's exactly. The universe, so that's why we can't. Exactly. The God would therefore be, as he says in Moses, in, in, in Moses, in Exodus, I am. It's, it's hard to break with just, yeah, just talking about authors, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> At least I didn't, you know, say something really horrendous, <laughs> which I have done before. Nothing is with God as it is with us. So, rephrase that. Everything that is with God is not with us. That is, everything that could be said truly about God, we cannot say. Because we don't have the words for it. Our words, our mental capacity, our understanding doesn't reach high enough. Okay, so how do we come into being according to the image of God? All right, he asks. So let's learn the things concerning God and understand those concerning ourselves. In other words, he's not going to say, well, let's try to figure out the mind of God. Because St. Ephraim has already said, don't do that. <laughs> there are certain things you should stay away from. All right? So, page 35. Um, I mean, obviously Ephraim wasn't the only one saying that. Obviously. No, obviously Ephraim wasn't the only one saying that. Uh, yes, St. Basil does refer to Ephraim in some other works. We, we do know. He's a contemporary. He dies a few years after, but he's quite a bit younger. He's about 20... Wait, yes, I remember. About 26 remember years younger the, or so. The introduction to Ephraim, there was, there was yeah. mention of saying, yeah, okay. Um, okay, middle of page 35. Oh, uh, first... Go ahead. The, the incorruptible is not picked as uh, in the corruptible, nor is the corruptible an image of the incorruptible. Is that a reaction to Platonism? Is that what we're seeing? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Top of 25, uh, 35, go to the bottom of 34. So let's learn the things concerning God and understand those concerning ourselves. That we do not have that which is according to the image in our bodily shape. For the shape of a body is corruptible. Because any shape is ultimately corruptible. The incorruptible is not depicted in the corruptible. What's the incorruptible? The image of God. So the image of God isn't in the material, okay? Nor is the corruptible, the material, an image of the incorruptible. Well, how do we see that? 
look at a child. A child grows, gets old, becomes very old, gets wrinkly, and dies. That's corruptible. The image doesn't change like that. So, it has a different color. He's talking about, you know, the human body and stuff. It has a different color when awake and when asleep, etc. So, how can what is changing, humanity, be like what is unchanging? What always remains the same, like what never has stood still? Hmm. In our image. Notice he's wrestling with that. What does that mean? Is something flowing the image of the immovable nature? The shape of that which has no shape? How then shall we search out that which is according to the image? Well, here's how. In the things which the Lord himself has said. In other words, if you want to figure out what the Lord means, you have to go back to what the Lord has said. Where is the Lord said it? In Scripture. Okay? So, if I say something of my own, don't pay any attention to it. What did we see repeatedly, even with some of the earlier fathers? Stick to what the previous team have said. Stick to the tradition that's been handed down. But if it's the Lord's, receive it. So he quotes the passage again. Let us make the human being according to our image and likeness. Ah, oh, but now he expands it. And let them rule the fish. Okay, so what does ruling the fish have to do with being made in the image of God? Well, how do you rule a fish? You go out to the ocean and say, fish, I command thee, come, you know, and the great white, you know, swims up and rolls over to be petted. No. You could try that. You could try that, That's sure. <laughs> the flesh is weaker than that of many animals. Hmm. But in what is the ruling principle? So how do we rule the animals? Reason. Reason. It speaks of the inner human being, the being made in the image of God. But you'll ask, well, why does it not speak to us of the ration bread? That is, why does God not say, let us make the human being according to our image in our faculty? It says that the human being is according to the image of God, but the rational part is the human being. Listen to the apostle. Although our outer human being is perishing, the inner is renewed to how? How okay. would the outer human being? Yeah, St. Basil asks, how? How does this happen? Well, I recognize two human beings. One, the sense perceptible. Two, or one, under the sense perceptible, invisible, the inner human. Okay? Now, I've noticed that Basil's um, perspective on the relationship body and soul um, is very uh, emphasizes the distinction as opposed to the unity of the two. Um, this, this is kind of interesting in contrast to Paul, who is, who is a lot more um, who, who seemed to emphasize a lot more the unity of the body and the soul. Where he would, where he, Does he? he would, well, when, like, he mentions that when you die and you're, you know, you go to paradise or heaven, you know, it, it's a period of naked and you know he doesn't he doesn't see that as a natural or or he, he portrays that as kind of a, as kind of a, a, an intermediary not a natural right. state because the body hasn't been resurrected yet right and and so there's this sort of there's this idea that the soul really wasn't created to be without a body exactly whereas, whereas Basil seems seems more seems to more seems more to I'm not directly contradict Paul. I'm not saying that. Right. It's just he seems to more see the soul as an independent entity. You know what I mean? Um, I know what you mean, but I think you're wrong. I don't think I don't think he is suggesting that. Um, I think it may, I think that may be more part of uh, your interpretation based upon your own background let me say, rather than what he is suggesting. Um, hold that idea until we get into this discourse and the second discourse a little more. And I think maybe we'll, we'll flesh it out some, uh, pun not intended, as we go on. Okay? So, I mean, look at what he said, because this is very similar to, to what Paul says. Um, 
So we have an inner human being, and somehow we're double. What does St. Paul say? I do the things I don't want to do. I don't do the things I want to do. And he talks about the flesh warring with the spirit. Right. Okay? For I am not the hand. I, the, whatever the speaking I is, am not the hand. But I am the rational part of the soul. Therefore, the body is an instrument of the human being, an instrument of the soul. And the human being is principally the soul in itself. He's not, he's not meaning there the soul absent from the body. But he's saying the I is principally the soul, the speaking essence, if you want. Okay, The body is not that. The body is the container of the soul. Okay? A disembodied soul, we would say, is a ghost if it was wandering around on earth. Okay? A soulless body is a carcass. It's a corpse. Soulless body has no purpose. Okay? A soul has purpose, whether it is bodied or not. It's supposed to be in a body. Okay? And that's why St. Paul is going to emphasize again and again and again that the two will not be complete until the resurrection. Which is why he does say, you know, to be absent the body is to be with Christ. Notice there, he kind of um, contradicts what St. Ephraim says. St. Ephraim says to be absent the body is what? To be, is to be on the border of paradise. Right. Not really quite there. Paul says to be absent of the body is to be with Christ. Boom. Now. Why? This day you shall be with me in paradise. Right. Christ says to the thief. Okay? So. And of course, well, the fact that Paul emphasizes the body, of course, isn't so much surprising because docetism was around even that early, you know. And, and um, or, or something similar to it, I should Yeah, say. something it's similar sort of to it. Um, like material is evil kind of concept. Well, yeah, Manichaeism was was around. I mean, it, it had been around for a while. But more importantly, because Paul's going to emphasize, as he does in uh, Romans and Corinthians, you know, if we're wrong about the whole resurrection thing, right, I, then we're wrong about everything. Yeah. And, and we're the ones, you know, to be pitied the most. Um, because the whole resurrection thing, you know, gets to the basis of, Christian morality, Christian virtue, you know, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Right. So it's not just the temple of the soul. It then becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit, which raises it even more. Therefore, don't go connecting it with whores and, you know, all this other kind of stuff. Right. You can see him saying, you know, anyone who tells you that Christ hasn't actually come in the flesh, exactly. you know, is, is preaching as a different gospel. Yeah, which is exactly what... John says in the three epistles of John also. So, let us make the human being according to our image. That is, let's give him the superiority of reason. Reason. Okay? And let them rule. Now, I really love this next sentence. Not, let's make the human being and let them be angry and lustful and sorrowful and throw in all your other adjectives about human behavior. Why? Because the passions are not included in the image of God. What does that mean? If the passions are not included in the image of God, is God passionless? That would be emotion. Yeah. Yeah. What does it really mean? Suffering. Obviously. Passion means suffering. Enduring something one doesn't like. Well, God can't do that. Simply on the basis of what we understand, our definition of that. Okay? Because what is enduring an emotion? It's a change of state. You go from happy to sad. Unchanging. Okay? So the passions are what happens the superior reason gets overruled. But the reason is master of the passions, or it be. So, and let them rule the fish. In other words, he says, what does that mean? You're a ruler. 
Go on to look at the top of 37. Human being, you are a ruling being. And why do you serve the passions as a slave? Command and power to rule. And yet you are a slave to passions. Okay. Now, I think this is, for, for lack of a better term, because he obviously isn't, this is the preacher in Basil coming out. This is the, the moralist preacher. He wants to modify people's behavior somewhat. But he's doing it for a reason. Because he's saying, Know you not you are made in the image of God as passionless. You also should not be ruled by your passions. Okay? Why do you throw away your own and become a slave of sin? Skip to the next paragraph. Why do you lament your slavery in the body? Slavery to what? To the body's passions. Hunger, desire. Why do you not consider great the sovereignty given you by God that you have reason as master of the passions? That's what Ephraim was getting about, getting at when he talked in the latter part of those hymns, when he talked about practicing the virtues, the able one to attain paradise. Okay? And he even mentions the virtues. Fasting, prayer. Fasting is not done to teach the body it's bad. Fasting is done to teach the body it is not in control. Okay? So, let them rule the fish. Okay? Notice, the rule was first given to us. Because they were put in a garden. They weren't put on an island out in the middle of the ocean. So how do we rule the fish? And he goes on and he talks about, you know, we fishing poles and fishing line and lure. I'm going to skip a whole bunch. Go on to page 40. And God made the human being. Okay, so what then is the human being? So now, let's listen to what we've already heard and what we've read so now we can define the human being. There is no longer a need for us to borrow foreign definitions nor to introduce the idea is of vanity into the reasoning of the truth. Here is the human being. The human is a rational creature of God. Okay? The dog a rational creature of God. I know, Jason, I mean, I look, well, our dog died last summer. The other dogs I have are all brainless. So, <laughs> cats, let me put it this, cats are not rational creatures of God. Cats are completely, or rabbits, or hamsters, or I don't know ferrets, or, I've got all these at home. <laughs> the human That's is a rational being to the image of his creator. If something is lacking to this concept, let those, let those who have spent much in acquirable wisdom examine it. That is, if I'm wrong and somebody knows more, let them examine it even further. According to the image of being. Right? So what did God then do? He blessed the human being and he said, grow, multiply, fill the earth. So what grow means grow up. You're born small, you get large, and then you die. Okay? Wasn't intended to die. I added that part in. Point. Okay? What does fill the earth mean? Grow and multiply, fill the earth. Page 42, section 14. Fill it in the places where it can be filled. It does not mean fill it by settling it all. Personally, I think Antarctica is crazy. It's not very habitable, or the North Pole for that matter, or parts of Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah, which I've driven through all of them, uh, parts of Oklahoma, parts of Texas, Southern California, the desert, in other words, okay? the earth, but do not fill it by settling all, for then we would have lived crowded together, if the earth corresponded in size to our habitations. But fill it by authority. By authority. Right? Page 43. 15. Let us make the man, let us make the human being according to our image and likeness. Notice, the plan had two parts according to the image and according to the likeness. But the creative work was one. So could he have planned it one way and replanned something else? In other words, was God making man? He said, oh, wait, sorry. 
miss something? Could some regret have followed regarding the creation? Well, what's regret? It's a passion. No, wouldn't work. Was there a debility in the creator? No. Or maybe it's just saying the same. Image and likeness are synonyms. No. Why? Because God doesn't repeat himself. So he says, can't be. So there's got to be another reason. Go down to the bottom of the page. By our creation, we have the first. We have the image. That's the rationality, the reason. Okay? And by our free choice, we build the second. By our free choice, that is, by our actions, our behaviors, our virtues, we build the likeness of God. Okay? In our initial structure, co-originates and exists our coming into being according to the image of God. By free choice, we are conformed to that which is according to the likeness of God. You know, and it's interesting that our translator uses that word conform, because what does St. Paul says? Be ye conformed to the mind of Christ. Well, what does that mean? It means co with, together, formed. Okay? So how do you do that? It's your choice. You choose to have the mind of Christ. Or you choose to be like God. He's going to tell us exactly later on how one does that. It doesn't mean you, you go off to some barren, rocky place and you say, let there be light, you know, and you try to mimic God in that sense. No, you do it by being who you were and who you're created as. So, this is what is according to free choice. That is, the likeness of God. This is where Adam messed up. Adam was made in the image of God, but he did not inherit the likeness of God because of the choice of the fruit. The power exists in us, but we bring it about by our activity. Notice, the power is inherent to choose right. Okay? But he says it's not enough to have that ability. It has to be exercised. It's like any other muscle. If it's not used, it atrophies. Okay? So, how... Skipping, um, no, actually, do the next sentence. If the Lord in his anticipation had not said in making us, let us make, and according to our likeness, if he had not given us the power to come to be according to the likeness, we would not have received the likeness to God by our own authority. If he hadn't given us the ability, we couldn't have done it. But now he has made us with this power to become like God. And in giving us the power to become like God, he let us be artisans of the likeness of God. I love that language. What's he mean? He let us to be, I'm going to use a term from J.R.R. Tolkien, sub-creators. God's the creator, we are sub-creators. God created man in his image, and he allows man to do what? To turn that image into the likeness of God. By subcreating. But it's not sub subcreating in the sense of taking dirt and forming it into something. It's subcreating in the sense of making right choices. Thus, uh, let me go back. Let us be artisans of the likeness of God, so that the reward for the work would be ours. Because what does God, obviously, in his infinite intelligence, realize about humanity. What do every one of you want to get on your midterm? A. Why? Because it'll look better on... Like okay, it'll look better on, you know, <laughs> transcripts and all. Why else? Because it's the best grade you can get. Okay. The longing for perfection. Longing for perfection? What else? Good time and effort. <laughs> 
Have you ever done something where you've not necessarily expected any praise or anything? And you've done it and somebody said, wow, that's really cool. That's very good. Well done. All of us essentially are like my two puppies. We want to hear, good job, and be patted on the back. We want that sense of acceptance. Okay? Thus, we would not be like images made by a painter. Okay? Without that free choice, without that exercising of free choice to choose to become like God, we would only be images of a painter or photographs. Because photographs can't act. They will always do what they are depicted doing. No. For when you see an image exactly shaped like the prototype, you don't praise the image, but you marvel at the painter. In other words, if we knew, I think this is what he's saying, if we knew who the model was for the Mona Lisa, and we could hold the model up next to the Mona Lisa, we would praise the model. We would praise Da Vinci. We would say, wow, look how he captured her like this. And we still do that if you know painters. Or if you've seen paintings of individuals, say he's captured or she has captured that person's essence, as it were. Okay? But it just hangs there. It's not like Harry Potter where the pictures move around from painting to painting, where the pictures are alive, so to speak. So, accordingly, so that the marvel may become mine and not another's. God has left it to me to become according to the likeness of God. And this is, you know, really the mind-blowing thing. Think of God as a potter. This is a clay pot rather than a plastic bottle. God tells the pot, you can be like me. But you have to try. In the inert pot move of its own, as it were, okay, and tries to become like the thing that made it. Is this the, the analogy breaks down. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> all analogies same, fall down. Is this the same bottle that you've been drinking from the whole time? Have you just been refilling it? Or? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> or it's one of another half dozen or so in the house. <laughs> Something like that. Um, I, I'm not sure I've ever seen like a bottle with that kind of cap. <laughs> yeah, not in the wild, no. So he says, I have that which is according to the image and being a rational being, but it can become according to the likeness. And use the language just a little bit. I become according to the likeness in becoming Christian. Why? Because the full Christian is the person most like God. Not the full Buddhist Muslim, not the full Jew, the full Christian. Because what does the Christian do? The Christian follows Christ, who is the exact image, the express image, according to Hebrews, of God. Which is why he then begins the very next verse, become perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, how do you do that? <laughs> Choices, decisions, actions. So now do you see how the Lord restores to us that which is according to the likeness? If you, if you become free of rancor, if you become not remembering yesterday's enmity, passionate, you are like God. That is, you do the, you are becoming according to the likeness of God. Okay? It, notice, it's, you know, some great deep theological thing where you have to, you know, read all these books and memorize all this knowledge. Exactly. Do. Do. Go and do likewise. Okay? If you forgive your enemy, you are like God. If as God is toward you, the sinner... Okay, so how toward you, the sinner, using St. Basil's language? 
What does St. Paul say? God loved us while yet in our sin. And what? Died for us. While in our sin. So if that's what God does towards us while we're still in our sin, and you become the same toward the brother who has wronged goodwill from your heart toward your neighbor, you are like God. Okay. So how do you do that? You become broken for the other person. Doesn't mean you know you go build yourself a cross, lay you up on it, and say I'm going to take upon myself the sins of the world. Doesn't mean you do that. It does mean you put their needs before your own. You put their desires before your. You know, people. Um, <laughs> hear all this nonsense in society. You know. Marriages, you know, and each person has to come 50%. What a total bunch of nonsense. A marriage is 100%, 100%. If one side only comes 50% and the other side comes 100%, then marriage will not last. Because going 100% of the way means not caring about yourself. It means totally thinking about the other. Okay? That's what he's talking about. Cared only for himself... He wouldn't be hanging there on the cross. Okay? So, you come according to the likeness by undertaking kindness. You come closer and closer to the image of God, to the likeness of God, by being kind to those around you. Doesn't mean being kind only to those who believe like you, think like you, those who act like you. It means, you know, being kind to those that hate you. Showing them mercy. Take on yourself a heart of compassion, kindness, that you may put on Christ. For, the, for through those things by which you undertake sympathy, you put on Christ. And drawing near to Him is drawing near to God. Notice. Drawing near to Christ isn't about proximity. It's not about getting within 300, 150 feet of a church. What is it? Drawing near to Christ is getting more and more and more like Christ. Okay? So, he says, thus the creation story is an education in human life. In other words, it is... I did bring it This is the thing I, I actually started writing several years ago. I've never done anything with it. Done any more with it. It's an education becoming fully human. Because as we aren't yet fully human, or what what Saint uh, what Ignatius called being a Christian, really calling oneself a Christian. Okay. So let him have us have by his creation that which is according to the image that is at his birth. Let him also come accord to be according to the likeness of God. For this gave the power. God gave the power to come, to be like God. Now the one is given, the other is left. The one image, okay, that is given, becoming according to the likeness is incomplete. Why? So that you may complete yourself. So that the pot can put on the glazing and can make itself perfectly round. Become worthy of the recompense by God. Become worthy of the reward by God. Okay, so how do we come according to the likeness, he asks? Through the Gospels. What's Christianity? Then we fit all this. Likeness to God as far as possible, as far as is possible for human nature. That's what Christianity is. Likeness to God as far as is possible for human nature. 
So what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything ultimately about what one thinks. How one thinks about God. It's totally how one behaves to those one comes into contact with. Okay? It's, you know, it's the ruler who comes up to Christ and asks, you know, what are the most important commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Well, who's my neighbor? Parable of the Good Samaritan. Who's the neighbor in the Good Samaritan story? The enemy. I mean, a lot of people don't seem to understand. The Samaritan is the horrible person in Judeo Judaic society. The Samaritan's the outcast. Think of the, the person you would least like to meet on the face of the earth. That's the Samaritan who stops to bind your wounds, take, pay for your health care. Okay? If you are shown to be a Christian, hasten to become God. Put on Christ. And I wrote off to the side, see St. Ignatius. Because <laughs> that's exactly what St. Ignatius is talking about. Okay? So then he addresses another issue, being the good thinker he is. Introduction dealt with this. Well, the woman's going to say, yeah, but what does that mean for us, women? Because it's the human being according to his image. The masculine, this is the terminology, it's masculine grammar used in the Greek, the man, human being says the woman. Well, what does that have to do with me? Because I'm not a man human being. So St. Basil says, the natures are alike of equal honor. That is, physical male, physical women. The virtues are equal, the struggles are equal, the judgment alike. In other words, we're no different. Okay, now keep, this is a rather radical idea because in the ancient world, I mean, especially in Greek society, women weren't even citizens. They were mere chattel, mere property. Okay? Christianity changed that. I think it's, it's funny that um, a lot of critics uh, will uh, talk about how, like, talk about some, some of the places, like in Scripture, where um, gender roles are uh, specified. specified. And, you know, but then when you go to Greek society, and they're not only gender roles, there's this almost seething hatred for women in a lot of Greek writing. Um, Middle East, yeah. Uh, and that's, that's partially, that's because of, you know, it's, it's proximity to the Middle East. I mean, but in Middle East culture, you know, women have almost zero rights, and in this period, even less, okay? So, let her not say, I am weak, even though St. Paul calls her the weaker vessel, all right? And probably what he means there is she is physically weaker, which is true. On an average, can you have women who are stronger than men? Yes, obviously you can. But if you, you know, rack up, the strongest female bodybuilder with the strongest male body, there's no comparison. The fastest male sprinter against the fastest woman sprinter, there's no comparison. The fastest marathoner, there's no, okay, physically, it's, you know, pure genetics and such. That's why they have separate categories in the Olympics. So, he says, the weakness is in the flesh. That's it. In the soul is the power. Since, indeed, that which is according to God's image is of equal honor, let the virtue be of equal honor. The showing forth of good works. And what he means by that is, women are not incapable of doing good works. Okay? No, in fact, what does he say? When has man been able to imitate the vigor of women in fastings, the love of toil in prayers, the abundance in tears, 
the readiness for good works. And what he means by that question is, I have seen more women who excel in these than I have men. Okay? And bear in mind, Basil set up monastic communities. Okay? Groups of monks and nuns. Because he, he was a, uh, he did not like the solitary hermetic life. He, he wanted people living in communion. In fact, even the monasteries that he helped set up, he did not set up out in the desert away from town. He set them up on the edge of towns. For one simple reason. So that the monasteries would have an impact on society. And so that people who were ill in society could come to the monasteries to get healing, physical and spiritual. He was the one who began setting up hospitals, orphanages, had those as part of his rule of um, monastic practice and such. Okay, So he goes on and he talks about you know women doing good things, etc. And he finishes that section before number 19. Therefore, you have become like God through kindness, through endurance of evil. Notice, endurance of evil. What does that mean? Not retaliating. Not, retaliating. Not even fighting it off. Okay? Talk about a foreign mindset. Through communion. That is, through, I don't think he means through the Eucharistic feast. I think he means through being in a living community with others, through love for one another and love for the brethren, being a hater of evil, not a hater of persons, okay, dominating the passions of sin that to you may belong the rule. And so now he goes back to, and let them rule fish and the wild beasts. Let them rule the wild beasts. You rule every wild beast. He's already talked about leopards and lions and all this kind of stuff. So now he's going to turn a little allegorical twist. Well, what beast do I have in myself? You have thousands. And a great crowd of beasts in yourself. Anger is a little beast when it barks in the heart. <laughs> and when anger is given free reign, what does it become? <coughs> A little dog, a little chihuahua barking in the heart. Not if you're like me. It transforms into a giant dragon or a lion, okay? Is not the deceit lurking in the deceitful soul harder to tame than every lurking bear? Is not hypocrisy a beast? Okay? Notice each one of these lacks reason. It lacks rationality. Is the greedy person not a rapacious wolf? Have you, top of 47, the first full paragraph. Have you truly a ruler of beasts? If you rule those outside, like subjects, but leave those within ungoverned. Okay. Oh, we could just spend the entire rest of the semester just unpacking that sentence. What is that, you know? What's more dangerous than this? When a human being is ruled by passion, when anger pushes reason aside, not consenting to remain within, and takes upon itself governance of the soul. Rhetorical question, don't answer. Can you remember when you have allowed that to happen? When anger has ruled? Yeah, Jason's going, ah. Right? <laughs> It's not a pretty sight, because what usually happens once the anger subsides in reason regains control. Oops. Shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have done that. Sorry. Hardest words in the English language to say, you know. Do not have airy thoughts. He's going on, you know. If you are a ruler, if you are a ruler of passions and a ruler of beasts, what else are you a ruler of? Winged creatures. Well, what are the winged creatures? Your thoughts that go off into areas that they shouldn't go to. What does that mean? 
It means when you start to think something you shouldn't, stop it. Don't entertain that thought. Notice, I mean, we that kind of language. Don't entertain that thought. What does entertain otherwise mean? Okay. What is entertainment? It's something that's pleasing, something that's fun. So don't entertain that thought means don't give that thought fun. Don't give it, you know, free reign to gamble and play and be all frivolous in your mind. Okay? Rule the thoughts in yourself. Why? So that you may become ruler of all beings. <clears throat> of all beings. Beings. It doesn't necessarily mean all beings out there, but it does partially mean that. Because you can't rule out there until you can rule in here. <laughs> Thus the rule we've been given over the animals trains us to rule the things belonging to ourselves. Or what are the things belonging to ourselves? Our passions. Our needs. Okay. Our own thoughts. Since the word of scripture will be turned back at you by those you rule... If your household affairs are disorderly, in other words, if you are called a hit because you say one thing and do another, he says, let us first. Physician, heal yourself. So let's heal ourselves first. Before we do what? Before we go and try and heal other people. Before we try and go fix their problems, you got to fix the problems inside. That's the whole thing about, you know, pulling the beam out of your own eye before you to pull the speck out of somebody else's. So, page 48. We'll at least get into the second homily. Nobody is condemned for not catching a lion, but one who will not govern anger is ridiculous to everyone. You know, I can think of a few public celebrities who have huge problems with their tempers. Alec Baldwin is one. I mean, you say something about him, you get in his face, and he just lets fly, just goes berserk. All right? So one who does not prevail over his own passion is led to condemnation. And what happens to those celebrities when they do that? Usually, there's a paparazzi, and we get it on photograph, you know. Mel Gibson, not only are there paparazzi around, there are phone answering machines with recorders that then get played back on the internet and become jokes for nighttime comedians for the rest of his life. While one who cannot prevail over wild beasts does not... Who does not appear to have done anything worthy of blame. Okay? Um, so, notice how he concludes... May the Lord who has provided what is written, that is the scripture, not this, who has also enabled our small and weak tongue to converse thus with you. He's talking about himself. He's using the royal we there. Who through our weak reason has intimated a great treasure for you in the few outlines of truth. Give to you through small things great things. That him, that is, may he greatly bless you through these small words. Through a few seeds of the perfection of knowledge, may he grant to us the complete reward of our free choice. But notice what's implied, the free choice must do. It must be good. And that you be fulfilled in the fruit of your enjoyment of divine words, blah, blah, blah. The end. Okay. Second homily. Any questions about the first one? On the human being. So, page 49. Um, go to the second paragraph. And he says towards the end of it, If you look toward our nature, that is, what we are at our birth or our creation, if you look toward our nature alone, it is nothing and is worthy of nothing. But if you look toward the honor with which he was honored, the human is great. Well, what does he mean in terms of distinguishing between 
our nature and our honor. What does he mean by nature? What is the human being made of? Dust. Dust. Dirt. Mud. That's it. He says, if you look at our nature, we're nothing. In terms of what actually forms us. All right? But if you look toward the honor with which he was honored, the human is great. What? What do you mean? Well, God said, let there be light. And light came to be. Top of the next page. But he did let the human come to be. He didn't say, let there be man, and man suddenly appeared. No. The Lord God took. Well, what did he take? He took dust. He take, took. He, whatever. He took <laughs> dust from the ground and molded it. Our body is quite worthy to be entirely molded by his own hands, he says. He did not tell the ministry and angelic powers to make this or that. No. He did it with his own hands. As an artist, he took earth like a potter. He took clay, threw it on that potter's table, and the clay started to spin. And he didn't just say, let it become a beautiful vessel. No. He put his hands to it. In other words, got his hands dirty. If you've ever made, even if it's only kindergarten finger paint, your hands have got to get dirty, okay? When you focus on what is taken, what's the human being? What is taken? The dirt, the dust. What art man that thou art mindful of him? Nothing. But when you understand the one doing the molding, then the human is great. Because God didn't take dirt or make the elephant or make the blue whale. Or make the dinosaur. He said, let them be, and they were. Indeed, he is nothing because of the material. And great through the honor. We're the only thing, Basil says. God said, okay, i got to personally get down in the dirt and do this. Okay? So, page 51. Ponder how you were molded. Think about this for a while. Consider the workshop of nature. The hand that received you is God's. May what is molded by God not be defiled by evil, not be altered by sin. You know, Job says, In my mother's womb you knew me. The psalmist says, Before I was, you called me by name. Okay? May you not fall from the hand of God. Notice that. How, go back. The hand that received you. That is, the hand that received you from the dirt. The hand that put you in its other hand and started molding. Whether we're talking Adam or whether we're talking through natural human procreation. That's doing that is God's. And he's saying, the hand that holds you is God's. Don't let what is being held be altered by sin. What was made was perfect. Glorify your creator. For you come to be for the sake of no other thing except that you be an instrument fit for the glory of God. Ponder that for a moment. You came to be for the sake of no other thing. That is, humanity wasn't made as a benefit for something else. Humanity made, was made as a benefit unto itself to receive the glory of God. The whole world, he says, is as it were a book that proclaims the glory of God. Okay? So be mindful of what has been said, meaning a book in the trees and the flowers and the rocks, etc. So God blessed them and said, grow and multiply, fill the earth. Growth of the soul is progress to perfection through things learned. He doesn't mean things learned 2 plus 2 equals 4, 4 plus 4 equals 8, no. 
while body gr bodily growth is development from smallness to the appropriate stature. That is, we can't really change our bodily growth other than through diet. But, you know, I can't at 51 go home and start thinking really, really hard for the next year. I'm going to be 6'2". I'm going to be 6'2". I'm going to be 6'2". And a year from now, I'll be 6'2". It doesn't work that way because my 5 foot 1 would be about 5 foot 4 and a half inches. <laughs> She'd still be tall, shorter than my son, who would still call her a midget, but she would not be 5 foot 1 and a half, okay? <laughs> Now, my question is, has anyone ever really tried, you know, just, just thought, I'm going to be 6'2 for a year? Does it work? Go ahead. <laughs> That's your final exam. <laughs> I would you, never you'll, ever go. You'll pass I'm only by inch. growing 6 inches yeah. between now and... So, he says, next paragraph, grow is said to the irrational minds, but to us, grow is said according to the inner human being according to the progress, which is growth into God. Okay? The inner being, being the soul's growth into God. What is likeness. See, likeness doesn't only mean what we consider like. It means God. Okay? Growth into God. So he says... That's what Paul was talking about. This is visions, acquisition of piety, extending toward the better, as we ever reach toward truly existing things. There is really only one truly existing thing, and that is God. I am. Okay. Giving the things that came before to seek what is lacking to piety. As everything else is a creation. Everything else could immediately go into unbeing. So, he says at the end of that paragraph, the growth, therefore, is a growth according to God, a perfect according to the inner human being. Okay? So, multiply. He says, this blessing pertains to let the theology not be circumscribed in one person, but what? Let the gospel be proclaimed to all the world. So how do you multiply? Multiply. Those engendered according to the gospel. In other words, Christians. Fill the earth. <clears throat> fill the flesh which has been given you. Through good. Notice he takes that fill the earth not to mean go out to Asia, go to Papua New Guinea, go to South America, go to South Africa, go to all the lands of the world. No. Fill the earth means Fill this receptacle with and fill it with what? Every good work. Let the eye be filled with seeing duties. Duties, obligations. In other words, let it see what it should see. Don't let it see what it shouldn't see. You know, like we could, I could pull up a, Half dozen sites right now on the internet that we shouldn't really see. Actually, I probably wouldn't get fired for that because it's almost impossible to fire anybody anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Except I am a happily married straight Christian, so yeah, I probably could be fired. Um, so he goes on. Let the hand be filled with good... Like what? Feeding the poor. Clothing the, you know, naked and such. May the feet stand ready to visit the sick. Journeying to fitting things. Not leading the rest of the body off to somewhere they shouldn't go. Of our limbs be filled with actions according to the commandments. This is what it means, he says. To fill the earth. Would, would completely blow most modern Protestants' minds out of the water. Because fill the earth is always taken to mean send out missionaries. And what he's saying is, no, no, the missionaries need to be here. You need to fill this earth first and talk to any other earth. Okay? Um, let's 
So he goes on in page 53. Talking about um, giving every tree which has fruit in it, which will be for food. And so he asked, and what's the mystery present for you in what is hidden here? What is here has a deeper hidden mystery. That is something to be brought forth. And he says, you know, birds are to eat certain things and other animals are to eat certain things. He says, for this law, for this cause, the lion is a carnivore. For this cause also vultures await carcasses. That is after the fall. Basil and, and other early fathers said there were no carnivores in the garden. Okay. Lions ate grass, in other words. No. Kind of just defangs lions. Just makes them no fun. I mean, they're just no cats. Well, now, I was actually going to ask a question about that because he basically said that they were created for this. Um, and so is it just the, the idea that God knew the fall would happen, so he created these creatures with the anticipation that they would eventually become carnivores, or... Robert? I think it's adaptation. It's <coughs> going back to the idea of technology, that everything has to now adapt to this new situation. So we need buildings, and we need to eat the dead. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, or they need to kill the yeah, dead to eat the dead. I don't know if it's, I mean... I guess as we go into the idea of it's not for you to know. Uh, but yeah, I would see it as adaptation. Not created for it, but, you know, when in Rome. When, when in Rome, do as the lions do. <laughs> Eat the Christians. Um, so he goes on and says, and maybe this will partially answer in the 20 seconds we have. Nature was not divided, for it was in its prime. Nor did hunters kill, for that was not yet the custom of human beings. Nor did wild beasts claw prey, for they were not carnivores. It's customary for vultures to feed on corpses. But since there were not yet corpses, not yet their stench, there was not yet such food for vultures. That mean vultures didn't exist? No, vultures existed. But what did they eat? Berries. Okay. All follow the diet of swamp. All graze the meadows. And as we often see dogs grazing on grass for the sake of healing... Not since it is food natural to them, but since the non-rational animals by some teaching of nature come untaught upon what is useful. Notice, they are taught by nature what is useful for them. Okay, So, after the fall, what happens? The animals come to realize, somehow. Bambi well, over there looks pretty tasty. A lot better than grass. Okay? <laughs> And they modify accordingly, or adapt accordingly. Okay, we'll stop there. Um, let me...